Well, I'm really excited. We've bumped into each other all over the world at the Paris AI Summit, but this is actually the first time we've gotten to sit down together, so thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so I want to quickly catch people up to both AMD's story and your story. You know, I've, I started covering, my first job in tech was covering semiconductors in 1999. Uh, Jerry Sanders was still running AMD. You know, it was known at the time as sort of the company always nipping at Intel's heels, rarely catching them, small market share. Intel mainly liked it because they could say we're not a monopoly. See, there's AMD. Obviously, that's nowhere near the position today. Can you talk a little bit about how AMD got to be where it is today? Give people a sense for the scale of it, and also, were there a couple key decisions that you think allowed AMD to flourish while others have struggled? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, thanks for having me. You know, I think you said it uh, best. AMD is a company with a very rich history. You know, we were founded in 1969 as one of the Silicon Valley, um, you know, companies. And, you know, frankly, our focus has been on computing all of this time. And from the standpoint of, you know, if you think about how far chips have come, like, for the longest time, nobody knew what a chip was, right? Nobody thought about chips. You know, it was something underneath the covers and not necessarily uh, front of mind. You know, for us, you know, it's our business, it's our history, it's our heritage. And, um, you know, we've been focusing, you know, I've been CEO for a little bit over 10 years. Uh, we've been focusing for the last decade on building, you know, bleeding edge, the highest performing computing chips out there. And uh, that is now extremely important. And that's why, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, here in Washington. We have a global business. I think, you know, everyone now recognizes that chips are a foundation for national economies, for national security. And for us, it's about providing, you know, all of the infrastructure. When people are super excited about AI, that's great, but you need all the chips underneath it to make sure that you can um, really turn that AI into something that works. And, and that's really you know, what we do. And it, it's really about you know, just building the, the fastest, most power efficient uh, chips that you can, uh, given that you know, things are changing. And you know, things, you know, if you think about in the past, people used to talk about something called Moore's Law and chips, where you would continually you know, uh, double the performance every you know, 18 to 24 months, but it was very linear in terms of what you do. You know, today, it's extraordinarily complex. So we're still seeing the same kinds of gains, but it's taking a lot more different tricks because you can't just thin the wiring a little. In that, that's exactly right. It's just extremely complex. You, know, you might call it a little bit black magic, but what it really is is uh, you know, just um, you know, putting together you know, let's call it 150 billion transistors in a very small form factor uh, to run all of this AI capability. So I want to talk, you know, Dario was talking about it on stage. You know, I think a lot of the question is, what should America's AI policy look like? And if you could set one or two priorities for Washington, what are the things that would ensure leadership in U.S. technology broadly, but U.S. hardware in particular? Yeah, well, I would start by saying I love the fact that, you know, we as a country are talking about technology leadership, you know, front and center. You know, the fact that uh, the administration uh, released the AI action plan, uh, you know, just uh, a couple of months ago, I think that was a very good blueprint of the fact that, you know, from my perspective, AI is the most transformative technology that I've seen, you know, sort of in my career, in my, you know, I think in our lifetime, uh, really. And you think about um, AI, you know, the, the correct usage or the, the most accelerated usage of AI are going to determine the winners and losers, both in you know, companies as well as in countries. And so for us to be talking about it as a national policy, I think, is a great thing. And you know, the, the answer for any technology that is so nascent is, you know, as a country, we have to run fast and even run faster. And that includes, you know, we're in a fortunate state that we have um, an incredibly innovative um, you know, set of uh, companies in the industry at every layer. You know, we're in the, you know, let's call it the silicon, the chip layer, but, you know, Dario was just on on the model layer, and there's a lot more in the infrastructure layer. But it is a very competitive world out there, and so we need to invest, you know, continue to innovate, and also ensure that, you know, we have the right policies, uh, that the government helps us have the right policies, including manufacturing in the United States, including making it easier to build data centers, including ensuring that we have enough power uh, to really unlock all of this, you know, technology capability. So there's certainly the aspect of it. How much do we invest? Do we make the right investments in those layers? There's obviously also the how do we negotiate policy with China, and that's been fascinating. You know, we've gone from, I remember when the supply chains were almost 
completely interlinked and people barely thought about the fact. And now it's obviously you know, a very different story. I'm curious because one of the most puzzling developments of the last year for me has been, uh, no, you can't sell this chip at all in China. Oh wait, yes you can as long as you give us 15%. And help me understand, because I don't really get, either it's a national security, like Dario's saying, this is the one thing we have, you're gonna ruin it. I haven't heard anyone say, and I've heard other people say, we should just sell and you know, if we don't make them, they'll make their own and better they use ours. This was the first time I've heard anyone say there's a percentage that if you give the US government, somehow it makes it good. Help me understand how this fits into policy. Yeah, sure. So let's take a step back and just look at what you know, the landscape is. And I would start with, look, uh, there's no question national security should be our you know, number one objective, right? That has to be first and foremost, um, above all. And we all believe that. I think from a um, technology standpoint, the fact that we are leaders in AI is actually a great thing for the country. And we need to continue to not only maintain that leadership, but really extend that leadership. Now then you go to the next level and you say to yourself, okay, um, the world is a global place. People need technology. Um, it, we have um, a lot of capability and we wanna make sure that the world is also innovating on our AI stack. And what that means is, you know, there's no one company that has the answer for um, all of the innovation in the world or any one country, frankly. Um, the, the innovation in technology comes through uh, a lot of learning across, um, uh, across different ecosystems, and we want the world innovating on the U.S. You know, AI technology stack. So I take it you disagree with Dario that we should just not sell to China because chips are the only thing I, I, holding us back. I, th I would disagree. Yeah. Yes, I would disagree. I think there, there, are, um, there are ways to um, really think about how we protect national security as our number one pro uh, pro uh, priority, which we are. Um, our most advanced chips um, are export controlled, and they should be export controlled. Uh, but there is also an opportunity for us to get um, a AI stack that is based on American technology out into the world, and I think that's a good thing. And, and that's really you know, what we have been uh, focused on, which is you know, finding that, that right uh, balance. I wanna shift gears a bit and talk about this infrastructure boom that we're having, because it seems like it's not only growing like this, like every month it seems like you know, we've gone from billions to trillions, like this huge scale. And I don't think, you know, I think Wall Street's super excited, um, but I'm also curious, like when Oracle's a big customer of yours, when they announce they're gonna pour hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, hundreds of billions into these data centers rather. Um, does that mean you guys are getting tens of billions, hundreds of billions? How big a deal is it for you that Oracle, which was not, which was kind of the company you turned to if you needed a little extra cloud capacity, but not one of the hyperscalers. What does it mean for you that they're building on such big scale? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's a indication of just um, how important AI and technology is. So, you know, we're sizing the market for, um, you know, AI um, data center accelerators at something like $500 billion over the next, you know, let's call it three or four years. Um, there was not too long ago that the entire semiconductor industry was 500 billion. So you can see the rate and pace of acceleration is such. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think um, Oracle's a fantastic partner. I think they've demonstrated um, a real, you know, sort of forward leaning thought process around, uh, you know, just what, what does it take to invest in AI? And I think we view, um, you know, across the industry, uh, this is something that we're all thinking about is, you know, how do we enable just more infrastructure faster? Because at the end of the day, what we're, we're saying is, you know, AI infrastructure is actually uh, equating to intelligence. So the more infrastructure that we can have, we, we want compute to be uh, something that's proliferated everywhere. Um, you can solve some of the world's most important problems and certainly the nation's most important problems. And when you look at the big customers, because we're really talking about you know, a number of big customers that you can name. There's a few in the US, there's some in China, a small number of uh, other places are making bids to have these big AI infrastructure, and certainly even the big US and Chinese companies, I think, would like to have these factories all over the world, these data centers. Um, how do you see that market growing in number of players? Because also we hear a lot that, you know, whether it's Meta or Google, Google already has their own chips, and a lot of the folks that are running these data centers also want to do their own chips. I'm curious, how do you think about the risks and opportunities of the concentration 
in the hands of a few hyperscalers. Yeah, I, I don't think we should think about this as a technology that is you know, in the hands of just a few. I think we should think about technology uh, in general as you know, it starts with a few who make the initial investments, but this is all about democratization of the technology. Like everybody should be using AI and everybody should be benefiting uh, from AI. And I think this is just, you know, if I think about sort of the technology arc, like I've spent a lot of time in the technology business, I would say that you know, we're, we're probably on a massive 10 year cycle in terms of you know, AI technology and AI build out, and we're probably two years into it. So we're still in the very early innings. Uh, one of the things I like to say, I mean, I'm sure everyone uses AI somewhere um, in their daily lives. It's good, uh, but it's nowhere near as good as it can be. And we're still learning how to make it better. And it's, it's frankly, it's moving at a rate and pace faster than you know, other technologies have, uh, have been adopted in, in history. So one of the other big debates in AI is should it be open, should it be closed? And that can happen at different layers. Most of the discussion is should the models be open weight? They're not, most of them with the exception of the Allen Institute aren't really open source, but they are open weight, you can implement them. Um, you've been pretty outspoken about the benefits of open source, um, but also you uh, embrace it when it comes to the software that runs on chips. So NVIDIA has their proprietary stack, you've pushed a more open stack. You know, what are people getting right and what are they getting wrong about this notion of open source and AI? Yeah, I think what uh, people are probably understanding is you're going to have a bit of everything in a technology that is as broad as it is. So if you think about, you know, just our, our mobile phone environment, right? You have Apple phones, you have Google Android phones, you have a number of makers that make things. And I think you're going to find the same thing in AI. Um, we are uh, firm believers in an open ecosystem for many reasons. Uh, probably the most important reason is that the more open the ecosystem is, which is, means that you, know, you can use um, any hardware layer, or you can use any models on top of that, you can actually um, continue to um, uh, interchange these things. It actually allows people a lot of choice and freedom in how they innovate. And we think that's essentially a good thing. Um, you, know, you know, there was a lot of discussion about DeepSeek earlier in the year when people were like, oh my goodness, like, how could deep sea happen given all of the uh, um, the constraints that there were in China? And you know, if you think about uh, what I found interesting about that deep sea moment was really you know two things. One is um, it, it is true you know necessity is sometimes the mother of invention, and so you, if you do have some constraints, you're able to kind of work around those constraints and really innovate around those constraints. Um, and so you know we found that. But probably the second thing that is most important. Uh, you know, learning from that is it was an open model, and because it was open, frankly, you know, whatever tricks that um, they used uh, Other could, people are now could be right. absolutely ported <laughs> into everything else, and so it accelerated the rate and pace of innovation. And frankly, you know, you can see open models now. You know, OpenAI has has released a model that's excellent. And I think DeepSeek was more about a more efficient way to do things Correct. than it was a better way. That's right. That's uh, right. So we only have a few seconds left, and it's weird to end on a competitor, but. You know, Intel has stumbled clearly. Uh, I'm curious how you view that. Is Intel's loss your gain, or do you think the US and AMD benefit from a strong Intel? Well, I think the um, overarching thing is in the technology um, industry, um, it's so important to make you know, good decisions. And I like to say that you know, for us, I mean, we're working on the roadmap now for our chips you know, three to five years out. And the decisions that we make today are, are really going to play out over the next three to five years. I think that's true for everybody in the industry. And so it's so important to make the right decisions. Um, I think Intel is a great company. I think they will continue to be a very important part of uh, the U.S. semiconductor ecosystem, certainly around manufacturing, and um, that being the case, you know, we, we certainly do find ourselves competing from time to time, and that's okay. Last question, because we're almost out of time, or actually out of time, but um, when you look five years out, like, what do you think, you've seen that roadmap, you're talking about it, what do you think will surprise people most uh, in the room that is possible five years from now that isn't today? Well, um, I think the, the aspiration, so you know, we talk about AI a lot, you read about AI a lot, but the aspiration that I have uh, is that you, know, you will find AI solving problems that you thought were not possible. And perhaps the area that I'm most passionate about, there, there's so many great usages of AI uh, you know, in, in, in business and science and all those things, but the place that I'm most passionate about is actually AI in healthcare. 
uh, because healthcare is such a personal thing for all of us. And if you just think about, you know, drug discovery, if you think about therapeutics, if you think about, you know, patient healthcare, if you think about equalization across the world, you know, think about not everybody has access to, you know, doctors at the Mayo Clinic, uh, but if they could get, you know, that similar quality of care in a rural part of, of the country, you know, that's the power that AI can bring. And we may not even need to wait five years uh, for some of those um, outcomes to happen. So there, there's no question in my mind that this technology can really just change the way we perceive uh, the, uh, you know, those problems that seemed insurmountable are actually eminently reachable. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to end it there. Lisa Sue, everyone, thank you. Thank you.